All right, and we're live. Thank you so much, Mayo, and and uh, so much thank you to the entire team that have been working hard to, to make this happen. We uh, we have a fantastic uh, agenda today. I, I know that many of us have uh, have had the feeling that you have looked on PubMed and then there was a paper that you wish you have uh, had been part of. And uh, I can't wait to see uh, Raghu Kalua's talk on, on collagens uh, today. Uh, so that's going to be an amazing talk. Uh, we also have uh, Sarah uh, that I've been working with for, for some years, uh, talking about how uh, uh, measuring biomarkers may uh, make a difference for patients. And we have uh, uh, Dr. Nicholas Williamson uh, from Nordic uh, talking about the collagen landscape in cancer and how fibroblast activities can be used for generating uh, good biomarkers. So um, thank you all for thank you all for joining, uh, and uh, and I can't wait to uh, to um, to see uh, what comes out of this. So before we we uh, we get started, um, oops, if I can have the next slide, please. So of course I need to say uh, thank you to the Extracellular Matrix Pharmacology Congress. Uh, that are allowing us to to host this. It's a series of symposium that's uh, going to be keeping us warm, uh, giving us a warm, fuzzy, fuzzy feeling until we meet in Copenhagen next year. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, thank you to Nordic Bioscience uh, for sponsoring uh, this event, making sure that uh, we have high quality speakers uh, and uh, high quality interactions on a platform that that is uh, that we all can use. Next slide. So, of course, we're going to talk about collagens. Many of you know that's one of my favorite topics <clears throat> in the world. I think uh, collagens are emerging as, as not just uh, passive molecules, but truly signaling molecules uh, that, we, uh, that we need to, uh, to take much more attention to. Uh, and uh, some of these collagens are, are beautiful and they are, they are they're needed for life. The, the collagens are below the base membrane of epithelial cells. I gave a presentation at the keynote, uh, no, at the Keystone Symposium in Banff. That was a fantastic meeting. Great people, great science. I made the small error of calling a fibroblast stupid and aggressive. One should never do that in that audience, but it was fun. But I think it's important that there are different type of matrices and we need to understand the fibroblast matrix and the epithelial cell matrix. Anyway, collagen is a way of doing that and we're going to hear about uh, some of those uh, today. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk about biomarkers uh, and that's also why it's called extracellular matrix pharmacology. Uh, some of these biomarkers can look into the future uh, and uh, find patients that are progressing. I think we, we begin to understand that uh, there are different endotypes in fibrosis, high turnover, low turnover, uh, same thing in cancer, that those uh, patients with high levels of fibroblast activities, I'm purposely saying activities, not activity, uh, that they are different from others. And then, of course, we want to have uh, drug development tools that, that we can use. Next slide, please. So my, I just have two more slides, and then we, we can, uh, we, then we should see the, the real presenters today. I think it's important that the body regenerates. I think sometimes we overlook that. I think it's important that that uh, really to make a difference for patients, to me, we need three things. We need regulatory quality, we need uh, technical quality, and then we need scientific excellence, of course. And I think we need to separate tissue formation from tissue degradation because the body regenerates, the liver re regenerates from 25%, the, the bones uh, regenerate every 10 years and the epithelium of the intestine every week. So if we're measuring something, we need to know is it formation or degradation. Otherwise, we do not know actually uh, what, what happens when we uh, look into that process. One thing that we're going to have uh, webinars of in the future is tissue destruction. Tissue destruction in autoimmunity disorders, in, in different pathologies uh, where patients feel their extracellular matrix remodeling. Uh, and I welcome any and all uh, suggestions from, from you to, to future events. And next slide. So I think it's important when we think about biomarkers that there are discovery biomarkers, that's good ideas, but we need to move those good ideas onto actionable biomarkers on a platform that's worldwide. Topic for a different day, but actually to make differences for patients, we need to have them FDA validated. Next slide. 
last line. So extracellular matrix modeling is fantastic. It's the central common denominator of more than 50 different pathologies. And I think it's important that we discuss that, that we quantify that, uh, and that we, uh, that we further research into that area for the benefit of patients. We, uh, we know that the extracellular matrix remodeling is, is really central in these pathologies. Uh, we started uh, out with a, uh, a webinar on, on, uh, on the cardiovascular with a recent New England Journal of Medicine paper. Today, we're going to hear from uh, three uh, eminent researchers in, in tumor fibrosis, how uh, cancers have uh, high levels of fibroblast activities in the modeling. But there are other areas that are long uh, with IPF, there are uh, kidney uh, and uh, skin pathologies, and also the autoimmune system with uh, tissue destruction that we need to pay attention to. And then no webinar without a small commercial. I'm so proud that my team and I uh, finalized the third version of the collagen book. Uh, and it's there are more colors and more collagens and better chapters than the previous ones. And I hope uh, this one also will be used uh, by many uh, around the world. So uh, with no further ado, I would want to uh, to introduce our Gupta. I just want to make sure, uh, Mayur, that we have Sarab online and he's uh, ready to go. Yeah, I can see that Sarab has joined as an attendee instead of a uh, yeah. co-presenter. So Sarab, if you could close the screen and um, open the link for the presenters. So while I have the chance, um, just a short reminder for everyone that is joining, uh, please put your questions in the private chat and we will collect these and ask these at the end of the seminar um, once we have the chance. So while Sarab is joining, I can see he locked off, so he will be joining in a minute. Okay, why don't we otherwise move on uh, with uh, Nicholas and then when Sarah joins, we can uh, switch to Sarb. That's perfectly fine. Then let me introduce uh, Nicholas. Uh, I'm super proud of, of the work that, uh, that Nicholas has been doing uh, in my group for the, uh, uh, for the last 10 years. Um, he's going to talk about, uh, of course, collagens and cancer today. Uh, and how we can understand uh, extracellular matrix uh, remodeling uh, in relation to different uh, tumor fibrosis biologies. Uh, also, uh, that, that uh, fibroblasts are not just fibroblasts, and how we can quantify these different uh, subset of fibroblasts uh, in serum and how that uh, may actually help patients. Then after that, Sarah is going to follow and actually show how that is done. And then, of course, we're going to have the talk by, by Ruka. Uh, so, uh, Nicholas, I hope you are ready and I can't wait to hear what you're going to say. Thank you so much for joining and being part of this. Thank you, Mon. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Three uh, hopefully exciting talks and some discussion afterwards. I'm looking much more forward to it. Hopefully, we can move the field forward together here. I think it's super important. Um, today I will uh, talk about uh, basically the variety of collagens that we have in cancers and linking that to fibroblast activities and how we can use that from a biomarker angle as well to address uh, this also uh, clinically. Um, I want to start by acknowledge my team, my collaborators within Nordic, my external collaborators, all their contributions to basically all the data that I'm going to show you today. It has been collected over a number of years. So uh, yeah, remember that. Uh, from a helicopter perspective, uh, we have all known this uh, tumor microenvironment at a glance uh, poster for more than 10 years now which nicely show us how many different uh, cell types there are in the tumor microenvironment. And clearly it also addresses some extracellular matrix surrounding the tumors. So there are two major components here. It's the cells and it's the extracellular matrix. 
And then on the on the right bottom here, I have included a slide to illustrate how much the extracellular matrix there actually is compared to the cellular components. And you can see in in pink, in breast, and in lung for here, there's actually quite a lot of extracellular matrix here represented by uh, total collagen content or trichrome stainings. And in some tumors, in some patients, there are actually more extracellular matrix than actual cells. Can you hear me? Hi, sir. Hi, yes, sir. we can hear you. Great. Sorry. Yeah, you can. Um, maybe Nicholas has started. Then go ahead. Uh, we I'll, uh, yeah, we will. Uh, we'll switch around, Sarap. So uh, yeah. Okay. Sure. Um, yeah. So um, basically, I think uh, tumor fibrosis is very important to understand and to treat. It's associated to immune suppression, and it's associated to poor drug uptake for patients. Sorry to interrupt. Sarb, could you um, uh, disable the video and the uh, sound for in the meanwhile? Thank you so much. Yeah, all right, thanks. Um, so this is a cartoon we did for a review paper that came out last year, just to illustrate very simplistically how a fibrotic tumor it's associated with a change in the immune cell compartment. You have a lot of immune suppressive cells. You have exclusion of T cells. You have fibroblast activation. And these patients with such tumors are not as responsive to anti cancer therapies, immunotherapies, as patients with less, less fibrotic tumors, which have a nice inflamed microenvironment. We know this already. But what we need basically is to treat those patients with fibrotic tumors. We need to figure out how to best possibly address that medical need. And we need biomarkers to find those patients. We need to stratify them for the clinical trials and we need to monitor their progress or their regress on treatment in different settings, obviously, to get the, to get the best results in this uh, endeavor. Uh, one of the most abundant and important components of the extracellular matrix is the collagens, of which there are 28 types. Type 1 collagen is the most abundant protein in the body and in the ECM, but there are these many different and very unique types of collagens that each plays uh, their own role in maintaining tissue structure and architecture. So that's important. I will, I will address several of these as we go along here. It's also important from the tumor's perspective because this collagen landscape actually changes as part of tumor genesis. So I just wanted to show you two examples here. On the left, you have a paper uh, coming from the Martinos group showing uh, how a very curly and healthy structured matrix can potentially lead to tumor cell dormancy. But when the uh, matrix become more stiff and linearized, you have an induction of cellular proliferation and tumor genesis. So again, the, the composition and then the, and the architecture of the matrix is important. Uh, on the right side, we have an example from Thomas Cortes groups who have shown in mice with breast cancer that there's actually an occurrence of some of these minor collagens, in this case, type 12 collagen in, um, in tumor-bearing mice. And we don't see this collagen present in the healthy fat pad of a similar mice. So, not only is the structure changes, but there is also a reoccurrence of some minor obscure collagens in the tumor tissue. And these collagens, as also shown in this manuscript, is important for, for invasion, for metastasis, and for response to treatment. Another aspect is the actual remodeling of the matrix. Uh, so this is a remake of Morton's previous slide, basically, where we have the concept of demolition and repair. So this tumor fibrosis is not static. It's actually an ongoing process that is driven by fibroblast building of matrices and other cell types, immune cells, tumor cells, degrading the matrix. And this is, is it is this loss of tissue balance that's also important to take into account when we try to understand the, the, the consequences of tumor fibrosis. So one of our 
go to to fibrosis biomarkers is pro-C3. So I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on, on this. Basically, what pro-C3 is, measured is illustrated uh, with this figure here. So when we have an activation of fibroblast into cancer, shows a fibroblast if it's tumorigenic setting, these cells begin to increase their production of collagens, in particular type 3 collagen for um, soft tissues. And when the pro-collagen is secreted into extracellular space, there is a need to release the pro-peptide in the NNC terminal end to allow for these mature collagen molecules to be built into fibers uh, that is making up a fibrotic compartment. Uh, now, luckily, uh, from a biomarker perspective, these pro-peptides are released into circulation where they can be picked up as non-invasive uh, surrogate readouts of the actual fibrotic activity or fibroblast activity in the tissue. So pro 3 is a biomarker of fibrosis or fibroblast activity. Uh, and we have shown uh, in an in vitro model of primary fibroblast isolated from normal pancreas and from pancreatic cancer tissue, that there's very differential fibrotic activity in such fibroblast. So when we culture normal Kiskan fibroblasts from normal tissues, they have fairly low levels of pro-C3, but when we then stimulate them with TF-beta, they become activated and they begin to produce pro-C3. Similar, when we isolate cancer associated fibroblasts, they intrinsically have a very high production of pro-C3. And when we treat those cells with an ALK5 or TDF-beta receptor 1 inhibitor, we can basically normalize the levels of pro-C3 to look like that in normal fibroblasts. So this is to indicate that uh, pro-C3 is a biomarker of fibroblast activity. Ultimately, we want to apply this uh, in the clinic, and we are doing so. And in particular, when we measure pro C3 in the context of immunotherapy and divide patients' pretreatment into whether they have high or low levels of pro C3, we see a clear association as to whether these patients will live long or less long, you can say. Here's an example from uh, metastatic melanoma patients where we have published uh, on three uh, cohorts uh, treated with each of their own uh, checkpoint inhibitors, so EP, Nevo, and Pembro. And in all cases, you can see that patients with high levels of pro-C3 have much worse outcome than those with low levels of pro-C3. So if you have low levels, you are in pretty good condition for responding long-term to an immunotherapy, but well, that is not clearly the case with patients with high pro c trees. So we need to figure out how to treat uh, those patients with an antifibrotic and potentially in combinations with an immunotherapy to get the T cells engaged as well. And we need to find those patients, obviously, at first time. Um, so actually, we have now collected so much data. Some of that was published. Uh, in a review uh, last year with a lot of our collaborators and including uh, input from Mina Bissell uh, on how we should basically um, use this readout for driving uh, fibroid activity measures into the clinical setting of solid tumors in general. And this data together with a lot of other data we have generated with collaborators has now been put into a large document that we have been filing to the FDA to hopefully get their endorsement in a letter of support for the first serological biomarker for tumor fibrosis. So we filed this a couple of months ago. We hope to be as lucky and skilled as we were was for HEF, HEF previously. And I hope to have some news on this in the next uh, couple of months. So this is quite an exciting time for, for pro 3 and, and for us uh, for, for see what FDA thinks. All right, so I will shift gear a little bit because how can we potentially use this when we know that there is more tumor fibrosis than pro 3 And we have also now beginning to really appreciate that fibroblasts are different. They are very plastic and they can change their profile, their role in the tumor microenvironment depending on their 
spatial location or the context that they are within. We know that there are myofibroblastic calves, there are inflammatory calves, there are antigen presenting calves, and there are possibly many other calves that you can define. Um, so how do we get a better understanding on what do these different fibroblast subtypes contribute to the tumor progression? How can we use that information to better target the tumor microenvironment? And how can we implement biomarkers of collagens in that regard? That was basically what we asked ourselves um, to hopefully help interrupt development in this space. And the whole idea is that you can have different cuffs or you can have cuffs in a given in a given shape on a given day that can either produce a tumor restraining or a tumor promoting microenvironment and a tumor restraining or tumor promoting extracellular matrix um, compartment. That's sort of the way we think about this. Um, so what we need is to understand which actional biomarkers can we link to this to go along when we do the drug development for targeting tumor fibrosis. Um, so what we asked ourselves, are there collagens that are specific to fibroblast subtypes? And can we apply some of these serological biomarkers, pros three and others, to measure these collagens as potentially non-invasive tools that can be applied all the way from preclinical to clinical settings. So to answer the first questions, we went into this publicly available data set where single cell RNA sequence, uh, sequencing has been conducted. It's on the pancreas uh, cancer samples and including some uh, control samples on the pancreas where we would then define the different uh, cellular uh, subtypes within this um, data set. And then our trick was then to correlate that to the different collagen expression profile that we find in the different cell types here. So you see the cell types on the on the y-axis, you can say, and the different collagen chains on the on the x-axis. And then we have a dot plot map. And then the red is the levels we found in, uh, in pancreas cancer. And the blue is what we found in normal pancreas. And as we would expect, we can see that most of the collagens are being expressed in fibroblast and stellate cells. We also see some uh, base membrane collagens in the endothelial cells, luckily enough, you can say. Um, but then if we take a little closer look at this, we can see that when we go from the more abundant major collagens, type 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, those are expressed both in the pancreas cancer tissue, but also in the normal tissue whereas some of the minor collagens are primarily only expressed in the pancreas cancer tissue. That was the first interesting observation we, we got from this. Well, we wanted to link that to specific subtypes of fibroblasts, so we uh, took some of the already published signatures on how you define MyCAFs and ICAFs and mesenchymal calves and so on to end up with these five groups of, of fibroblasts in this particular data set here. Um, and then we did the trick again. We correlated the collagen expression profile to the different subtypes of fibroblast. And if we look at it uh, broadly, we can see that the major collagen seems to be more generally expressed across the different subtypes of fibroblast, whereas the minor collagens here, in particular collagen 8, 10, 11, and 12, is very much associated to my calves, whereas maybe type 14 collagen is potentially more associated to an eye calf in this particular case. So potentially we can have biomarkers of general fibroblast activities. Those would be the most abundant fibular collagens that we have studied the most, type 1, type 3, for example. But maybe the minor collagens are more specific to these fibroblast subtypes. And maybe that can explain the, some of the unique role that they may be having in tissues. So next, we wanted to see if we could use our biomarkers reflecting some of these minor collagens in the context of cancer and how did they perform in comparison with the major collagens that we have been studied more 
historically. So what you see here is uh, on the top row, we have major collagens, one, two, three, four, five, six. And on, on the bottom, we have minor collagens, uh, 8, 10, 11, and some of the even minor, minor collagens, the phasic collagens, 19, 20, and 22. Uh, so the red um, histograph here is the healthy levels and the different colors is different tumor types. Biomarkers measured in serum of those patients. And what we can see here is that the major collagens on average is probably twofold increased compared to the healthy levels, whereas the minor collagens may be three to seven fold increased on average compared to the healthy levels uh, across different solid tumor types. And I want to highlight type 11 collagen, which was one of these that we and others have seen highly associated to, to my caps. If we plot this, these data here a little differently and, and look at the, um, the area under the curve for the ability to separate from a healthy levels, healthy, healthy volunteers, then we have plotted here a heat map for the AUC. The, the more red, the closer to one. And on the bottom, we have the different tumor types. And actually, Pro-C11, so type 11 collagen, was the biomarker that was best at separating cancers from healthy um, patient, uh, healthy volunteers. You, for comparison, you can see Pro-C3 down here. In this particular data set, that was uh, fairly good at uh, separating pancreas, ovarian, uh, bladder, colon cancer, and lung cancer, so all are very fibrotic tumor types. But the best one was Pro-C11. If we also look at sort of a scatter plot, we are not necessarily looking at a new diagnostic tool, but more as a tool to segregate patients. So it's important that we also have a large interpatient variation. And I think it's, it's fair to say that that was also the case here. If we look at the different indications, and the spread on the on the on the, on the biomarker levels here it's fairly large within the indications as well. So there's room for for grouping patients into whether they have high or low biomarker. It's not just that they all cluster together. And we did that. We published that in pancreas cancer uh, in the biopack cohort. For those of you that are familiar with that, it's a last observational study of pancreas cancer patients treated with standard of care chemotherapy, and when we divided patients into whether they have high or low proceed at baseline, and then we can also see a poor outcome for those with high levels of proceed tree. Uh, three fold differences in the fraction of patients that are alive at the two year follow-up time point. Uh, what was also interesting in this um, RNA-seq data set was that there's an actual already uh, Collagens that could not really be detected here. Collagens of the facet group, very minor collagens, in particular 19, 20, and 22. And that raised our uh, eyebrows, you can say, because there's actually some of the biomarkers that we serologically saw, so being high performers in terms of separating out cancer patients from healthy volunteers, so type 19, 22, and 20 here. Moreover, we also see a very nice interpatient variation with these biomarkers. This is type 19 collagen is an example. And for uh, type 22 collagen, we're also wrapping up our manuscript showing prognostic associations. So when we measure type 22 collagen or pro 22 in serum of both operable and inoperable PDAC patients, we see that they are highly increased. And we see them um, performing uh, in terms of predicting poor overall survival in both groups of patients and independent of stage and tumor size and CA99, so all the risk factors included as well. So to uh, wrap it up, basically all this newly generated data has led us to uh, this minor coll collagen hypothesis that we are working on. Basically what, what we are trying to explain with this figure is that why we have the dotted line is the major collagens and the full line is these minor collagens, the phasic collagens and, and the light type 11 collagen is also a minor collagen. Um, the major collagen is 
older during embryogenesis, is older during um, early adulthood, and then it seems to level off. In real adulthood, you can say, unless you have an insult such as tumor genesis, then you'll have an increase in this turnover of, of major collagens, as we see with protein 3. In contrast, the minor collagens are super important during embryogenesis, but then they seem to lose their relevance and being very slowly remodeled in, in adulthood. Unless you have an insult, then the window is much larger for these minor collagens. So it's a very promising biomarker for that reason alone, but also as I showed you for the relevance to profile blood types of, of fibroblast. So to wrap up, uh, cancer is truly a fibrotic disease. The collagen landscape changes in cancer and we need to understand how and why. We know it affects prognosis and immunotherapy efficacy. The minor collagen seems to be in particularly elevating cancer and maybe more specific than the major collagens. And they may also be more associated to subtypes of fibroblasts. So when we begin to treat tumor fibrosis and subtypes of fibroblasts, we need to apply actionable biomarkers. What happens when we deplete only a subset of fibroblasts? Can we monitor the, how the tissue would then change and what happens during regression and progression of patients? So with that, I will stop my talk, give the word to Sarah and Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Nicholas. That was a, that was a great presentation. <clears throat> while while Mayor is collecting the questions, I'm I'm I mean, being the chair, I have the provocative to 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 at least ask one question. Is it fair just to to put them into minor collagens and major collagens? Because I'm I'm I think that some of these uh, collagens we're used to thinking of them as fibula. But I think that they are doing so much more. And I think the Thomas Coxton paper showed us that uh, the facet collagen 12 was doing something completely different to the matrix. So possibly we need to look at the canonical and the non-canonical collagens and, and say, what is it that they're doing to the matrix? Can you just extend a little bit on facet collagens? Uh, because I think collagens are not just collagens. Yeah, absolutely, of course. Uh, you, can, you can group them for simplicity and for explanation, but as a group, as a group, basic collagens are, um, of course, less well studied. We know less about them, but they're also much more deregulated in pathology than the um, than the uh, major collagens. But we know, of course, that they are also different in between them. So we know that type one, co type twelve collagen is in particular found in the invasive front of tumors. Type fourteen collagen is found other places. Type 22 collagen is found in the interface between the basement membrane zone and the, and the, and the fibrilla uh, stroma. So truly they are also unique on their own right. So it, it was a way of simplifying the message a little, a little bit, but of course it's too much of a simplification also you can say. Thank you, Nicholas. I think we need to get going uh, in in conscious of time, and then uh, Mayu, if you if you collect the question. So, so um, extracellular matrix pharmacology. Uh, we started last year with a fantastic uh, conference in Copenhagen. I, there were four hundred people uh, discussing extracellular matrix biomarkers, but equally important, we had many pharma companies that are there because. I mean, we need those pharma companies because if not, then we're not making a difference for patients. And this is why uh, we can debate which talk is the most important one, uh, but it is super important that we, through the use of some technologies, uh, that we try to make a difference for patients. Of course, then, then I was thinking, who, who should we have talking about uh, how to make a difference for patients? I've, I've worked with... Uh, Dr. Gupta, and on many occasions, he's a super smart guy. Uh, last time we published was on uh, was on acute and chronic liver failure, clearly showing one of the best biomarkers in liver fibrosis. Not the topic of today, but we need to have a willingness to change the life of patients through biomarkers and drug development, which is why we absolutely need to have drug development companies presenting on how they're thinking to change the life of patients. So I can't wait to hear what you are going to say to us. I've been looking forward to that. And thank you so much for participating. Oh, so, sorry, we can we cannot hear you. Uh, can you? No? Yeah, yeah we can. 
So, okay. so just before you start, um, just a reminder for everyone, for those that joined in a little later, thank you so much for joining. Uh, if you would please in, uh, ask your questions in the private chat in the right box, um, then we can take those at the end. And thank you so much, Sarab. Uh, I'll give the word to you. If you okay. use the start presentation button on the bottom, you will be able to uh, share the slides and then just go to your slide number eight. Perfect. Yeah. So I have Ragus. It's Ragus. Maybe mine is. Mine would be earlier, maybe in the. Hold on. I think I can uh, change it for you. Uh, yeah. I think I'll going through maybe. Oh. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, it's uh, exciting to uh, share this virtual space with Dr. Kasta, Dr. Kaluri, and Dr. Williamson. And uh, very much looking forward to interact with uh, ECM enthusiasts joining us virtually. Um, uh, so as uh, Dr. Williamson uh, beautifully laid out, uh, you know, uh, this uh, and the landscape of uh, different collagens and different collagens marker actually to my next slide in today's talk i'll touch upon uh, ecm changes in tumor which is kind of broadly covered by dr williamson so i'll kind of lightly touch upon that and how these ecm biomarkers are associated with clinical outcome and then uh, i'll share our findings from um, recent first line uh, uh, RCC study uh, where we looked into the association of these soluble markers for the first time in clear cell RCC. Um, if we look into uh, the uh, extracellular matrix changes in cancer, um, uh, now they are well documented, but I think important thing which I like to highlight uh, while this figure on the right side, there are many facets of it. You know, uh, we can look into, uh, uh, you know, different components like the biochemistry uh, like how is the uh, stromal cells vis-a-vis -vis the cancer cells how they are interacting uh, you know there is an inflammatory milieu with the growth factors cytokines etc uh, making it more pro-inflammatory then impacting even the hydration which kind of is important for large polysaccharide like chondrin sulfate the post translation modification as cross linkage etc are well documented and they do impact the biomechanical properties which then tend to change the density and deposition of uh, collagen around the tumor which can uh, lead to the phenomena like dysplasia uh, further the structure organization and even the porosity of uh, these collagen uh, are impacted uh, in the uh, when the patient is suffering from cancer the degradation markers actually are well documented through the soluble uh, markers uh, which are available and additionally then you have the addition molecules and the various ligands interacting or uh, giving an interaction opportunity whereas of components of the extracellular matrix and also the parenchymal and the stromal cells so the alteration in this ecm then you know uh, leads to all this desmoplasia immune separation and obviously impacting the uh, 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 interventions efficacy in the cancer understand ECM uh, in the clinical studies, I think it's uh, uh, much easier if you have the biopsy, then you can uh, go through the regular route. Uh, and then you know, you can do the histology. And uh, here is the uh, trichrome staining, uh, where you see the normal cells and then increase the blue uh, collagen uh, stains uh, in the, across the di uh, different solid tumors. And uh, the uh, fibrosis uh, in these extracellular matrix uh, things can be studied through different markers, including uh, FSPs, uh, Wilmington's, uh, alpha smooth muscle actin, etc. But again, the common denominator for the clinical uh, trials to study these kind of changes is a fresh biopsy. Fresh because you need to understand the contemporary uh, landscape of uh, collagen within the tumor. However, fresh biopsy, uh, first of all, it's not patient friendly. It does provide 
or lead to hindrance in patient recruitment. So the circulating markers make much more sense. And I think it from the technical aspects also, because biopsy is a small representation, tumor heterogeneity is a well-known factor, which hinders that, you know, the biomarker development through the FFP blocks. And then there are certain tumor types where you have kind of biopsy coming from bone, et cetera, makes it even difficult to do a proper staining, et cetera. So I think that way, the circulating bi biomarker, although they are a surrogate, but I think they give easy accessibility. And the other thing, which I may say so, is kind of they are kind of a total systemic readout, uh, which is there in the body. And if you can uh, really tease out the difference between healthy versus the cancer patient, you have more uh, comprehensive readout of the situation rather than taking a small biopsy. Uh, Dr. Williamson already uh, elaborated on this figure, but I just like to highlight that within the solid tumors, I think uh, uh, markers like pro CT has really made an uh, impact. And as uh, uh, indicated by Dr. Williamson, that has already been a letter of intent uh, uh, submitted to if. And uh, the idea of you know looking into the high net fibrotic activity has clearly indicated that if you have a higher baseline of markers like pro C3, that increases the risk by two to threefold in these solid tumor settings. Another kid on the block or exciting tumor uh, marker is endotrophin or uh, uh, pro C6. And this is exciting because it has uh, tremendous uh, signaling capacities and uh, it is almost equipotent uh, in terms of its fi pro fibrotic potential, uh, similar to TGF beta. And I think within um, the crisscross uh, of using these markers across the different therapeutic area, we've learned a lot on these markers as, you know, uh, Dr. Kastas was pointing out like uh, acute on chronic liver failure, et cetera, in NASH space. These markers were clearly increased in uh, NASH patients as compared to healthy. But again, uh, within the spectrum of evolution of this disease, these markers are uh, further increased in cirrhotics and even higher in the hepatocellular carcinoma patients. So the subset of these markers, named the PRO-C6, it's a degradation counterpart C6M, uh, or alpha fetal protein, um, higher level of these markers uh, indicate uh, uh, bad outcomes, both in terms of the progression-free survival and uh, also the overall survival. And when you combine these markers, for example, uh, here you see the relative hazard ratio on the y-axis. Uh, so you see that uh, if you take individual markers, your hazard ratios tremendously or significantly improve if you combine two markers, for example, adding uh, pro-C6 to the uh, patients who are alpha uh, fetoprotein positive, you do see a uh, almost 2.5 fold increase in the hazard ratio. So overall, I think the strength of these biomarkers is they being a good surrogate. But again, if you combine them, uh, we can increase their predictive or the prognostic potential here. Uh, within RCC space, uh, the fibrosis EMT hexes has been well characterized, but from the molecular and uh, immunohistological perspective. So uh, for example, the uh, EMT, uh, 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 related markers like Wimenton, uh, Cadherin, uh, uh, MMPs, et cetera, are impacted. For example, VM, uh, Wimenton is significantly increased, uh, whereas NO denotes the normal tissue, uh, and, uh, TU uh, represent the uh, tumor tissue, where the epithelial marker Cadherin is decreased, collagenase like MMP14 is increased. And then you see across the disease settings, these markers do uh, uh, connect well with the different cancer stages. Further, the composite score, like the EMT score between the normal and tumor is significantly increased in the tumor subset. And interestingly, the patients who have high EMT score also have high druggable immune targets, uh, like, you know, uh, PD-1, PD-L1, ctl 4 and PD-L2. So we set out to understand these soluble biomarkers also in clear cell RCC, and we leveraged uh, our uh, Checkmate 214 study. And this we presented last year uh, in SITC. And uh, this particular study in the first line, uh, here the patients were stratified based on the IMDC criteria. I'll come back to on the IMDC prognostic score uh, in the later slides. 
and uh, uh, there were two arms arm a nevo plus epi uh, followed by nevo mono and the arm b was the control arm where sunitinib was given once daily and the uh, co-primary endpoint was orr os in the pfs uh, the uh, marker's description has been beautifully covered by Dr. Uh, Williamson. Uh, so just to kind of uh, emphasize that we went through around 17 markers, which ranged from the ECM formation, ECM uh, degradation, we have the basement membrane, uh, the fibrillar collagens, and also markers associated with the inflammation, uh, like a Wickham uh, uh, CTHNE2, which is, uh, denotes the neutrophil activity, uh, lab TGF beta, which is kind of a uh, surrogate for active TGF beta, and tumstatin, which uh, is a signaling peptide of the basement membrane. As uh, described in the previous talk, they can be, you know, uh, also classified major uh, and minor collagens. I think that's another in interesting context uh, we should look this data from. But currently, uh, these were the main categories uh, we use this marker. So the context of use is regarding formation, degradation, and inflammation. That's what we were monitoring. To start with, uh, as we started simple. We just wanted to understand how these levels change as compared to the healthy volunteers. And uh, the color schema is uh, on this particular Manhattan plot. What you see, yellow is uh, less than twofold uh, increase, uh, teal is uh, two to threefold, and the red hue indicates more than threefold increase. Uh, so all the biomarker tested was significantly high in the healthy volunteers uh, as uh, sorry in the cancer uh, in one first line clear cell rcc patient as compared to the healthy volunteers and interestingly the inflammatory collagens uh, like uh, cphne2 uh, wickem lap tgf beta were uh, more than threefold high uh, including tumstatin which is signaling uh, uh, collagen again uh, their level was also more than threefold high establishing there is a high turnover of these extracellular matrix protein and each of these protein does have a unique story associated with it sorry just I'll switch the line. Further, we looked into the association of this ECM markers with the clinical and histological features. First, we looked into the IMDC risk score. So IMDC is a, a composite of six variables. Two of them are the time to the treatment after diagnosis, Karnofsky performance score, and there are four clinical labs. And then you get score of uh, in uh, the categories of zero, uh, one to two and three, and these are uh, describing favorable, intermediate, and poor, poor risk subjects. Uh, so based on that, the treatment are uh, given to the patients. For example, nevo uh, is approved in the uh, poor to intermediate settings. So what we found that across this IMDC risk score, uh, all the markers were significantly associated except Pro-C23. In case of the sarcomatoid uh, uh differentiation which is a more aggressive uh histology of rcc we do see at least nine biomarkers which were significantly associated out of that you have the pro c3 you have pro c6 inflammatory collagens like uh, cphne2 lap tgf beta and also the tumstatin And uh, I like to emphasize this is the first time that, you know, in the sarcomatoid patients, we have some soluble biomarkers which can separate the sarcomatoid differentiation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the uh, patients with the not sarcomatoid differentiation. Although this is a first study, uh, additional studies would be needed to kind of uh, uh, confirm these findings. Uh, we also looked into uh, the Cox proportional hazard model. So this is, uh, I'll take a little time to explain that, but I think from the clinical studies, it's important to understand, are these elements prognostic or predictive? So the prognostic elements are described where you see the association in, in at least one of the arms. Uh, predictive are uh, described uh, based on uh, statistically significant interaction effect, where there is a differentiation between uh, the two arms. And uh, if you see the brown dots uh, represent the PFS and the blue dots represent the OS and the dotted line is indicative of uh, 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 log 10 adjusted p-value here it's 1.3 what you can see here 
on the x-axis. So as you see association in at least one arm, which indicates the prognostic behavior, you have both for the OS and PFS with the adjusted p-value for the multiple corrections, et cetera, there are a range of the markers which are prognostic. However, in terms of the predictive behavior, uh, we have uh, like Pro-C3, Pro-C6, you have the formation, you have the degradation, you have the inflammation marker, which are significantly associated with the PFS, means uh, they are underlining the predictive behavior of these markers for the PFS. However, none of these biomarkers were associated with the overall survival in terms of uh, the interaction effect. Next slide. Further, there is another way to look into this data, and that can be looked from the perspective of the hazard ratio. So there are uh, these uh, five different variables, the hazard ratio one, that is uh, hazard ratio comparing nevo ip versus sunitinib at the 75th percentile. So uh, if you look into that treatment effect, this is the most uh, differential, where you see the hazard ratio for the tumstatin, lac tgf beta C4M, Pro-C3, all are significant in the hazard ratio one. However, uh, if you look into the hazard ratio four, which is the hazard ratio comparing the 75th and 25th percentile between the nevo ip you don't see that differentiation. But to again re-emphasize the prognosis, uh, the predictive behavior, when you look into the HR4 versus HR3, that is between the nevo ip versus sunitinib, you see that distinction happening across the board for these subselect of markers like Pro-C3, you see the hazard ratio 0.6, C4M, you see uh, 0.6, again, emphasizing the predictive behavior of uh, these markers for the uh, progression-free survival in Checkmate 214. Uh, just to illustrate uh, through uh, another uh, graph, so what you see here, uh, the lab TGF beta, which is a surrogate for the TGF beta activation, the sunitinib is denoted by the gray line, and nevo ipi uh, is denoted by the orange line, and you see uh, the relative level of TGF beta on the x axis and hazard ratio on the y axis. So, interestingly, the behavior of these is uh, going in, you can say, strictly is kind of diagonally opposite that as the TGF beta level increases, the hazard ratio. Uh, also increases for sunitinib, that means the patients uh, would have worse outcome. Whereas nevo ip with the increasing level of the lab TGF beta, there was improvement. And this is further, you know, uh, demonstrated that at high tertiles, there is uh, increased separation. These shadowed portions are the 95% confidence interval. The underlying mechanism is not clear, but it can be uh, because the TGF beta also induces EMT through the MAP kinase and uh, the RAS pathway. And uh, what you see here, for example, in the uh, KRAS positive subject, uh, positive uh, uh, pancreatic organoids, you see that uh, EMT uh, 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 transcript uh, SNA1 is significantly increased. Uh, similarly, if you see this uh, RAS responsive element binding protein, abbreviated as RREB1, uh, you uh, see in the wild type, it's clearly in, uh, inducing, uh, induced by the TGF beta, but not in the knockout uh, organoids. Uh, finally, looking into the TGF beta and uh, the CPA HNE2 from the ORR perspective, again, we saw a very interesting behavior. Uh, in the nivo ip the CPA HNE2 levels were significantly increased in the responder patients, and responders are defined as the best overall response. That means it uh, consists of complete responders and partial responders. Non-responders had the patients who had either uh, uh, stable or the progressive disease plus the non-evaluable. Whereas in case of the sunitinib, the level of CPA HNE2 were much higher in non-responders, uh, uh, both for the CPA HNE2 and lab TGF beta. Uh, uh, HNE2 is neutrophil elastase activity. Maybe it has some resonance in the clinical development also because we do see neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio as it increases, it uh, worsens the prognosis. But here we are talking about the predictive behavior because nevo ip versus sunitinib, there is a differential behavior of CPA HNE2. And if you look into the literature, there are also anecdotes which report that high tumor inflating neutrophils are associated with the worst overall survival. 
and which is associated with the loss in e cadherin indicating the EMT uh, transition. Finally, I would say for the future directions uh, and uh, conclusion from this particular study does indicate that RCC, there is definitely high turnover and high level of these inflammatory markers as uh, underlined by CTHNE2 and lab tgfp does, uh, did respond well to nevo ipi and high level of this ECM marker as associated with poor OSNPFS. Uh, predictive value of these markers, there are good uh, 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 hypothesis generations. Uh, data from this particular study need to be uh, uh, you know, coordinated and uh, confirmed in the largest settings. And the ECM, uh, you know, uh, markers need to be integrated, for example, maybe uh, like IMDC criteria to see uh, can we even impact at the prognostic level because IMDC has evolved from the, uh, you know, TKI studies, not, uh, this is not even meant for the IO studies, but we still use it. And maybe, you know, me, uh, being biased coming from pharma and specifically from BMS in terms of immunology. So I think maybe we need to have more systematically a systematic study of how uh, collagen affects the T cell toxicity, cytotoxicities, uh, infiltration, proliferation, and also looking into the other immune cells like uh, neutrophil and uh, macrophages. And finally, I'd like to thank patients and all the team members involved in this study. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, uh, Sarup. That was uh, really the talk we needed. Um, where we where we can see how can we change the life of patients by using these uh, these biomarkers. Before I introduce uh, Dr. Kalouri and, and and thank you for joining, I really appreciate that. Um, there are a million questions in the chat. Uh, Mayor, do you want to take just one of those questions and then ask uh, Sarah? Um, otherwise, I um, yeah, I think yeah, of course, of course, I can do that. Um, so Sarah. One question is, do you know if the ECM slash stroma signatures in CM214 are specific for ARCC or in other indications as well? Uh, sorry, these signatures are specific to? Uh, for RCC, so. Uh, I don't think so, uh, you know. Uh, I wish, uh, but uh, that need to be investigated, I think. Overall, maybe the dynamic dynamism of these markers, the relative changes from the baseline to treatment, uh, and maybe taking five, six markers like major collagen, minor collagens, formation of collagen, degradation collagen. I think that may give us, but at this juncture, I won't say these are specific to uh, you know uh, uh, RCC because you know uh, as we know, fibrosis is a common denominator for many things which are going bad in the body. So. At this juncture, I don't think so. We are in that condition, but I think aspirationally, it's a good exercise, and we should strive for that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you one question. So, if you look at those that have high levels of cord information, then there are actually differences between the IO treatment and the RTK. TK, yeah. And I think that's amazing. You can look at the baseline and direct patients to where they may have the most benefit. Why do you think that is? I think in terms of maybe I think that speaks to the biology of it because you do have, you know, TKIs have a different biology vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the immune therapy, it uh, the way it works. And I think that uh, question will be answering more soon because we have also the on-treatment analysis where you see how the TKIs is behaving. And there is a very characteristic difference how the TKI behave versus the IO therapy behaves on the on treatment samples. So I think uh, I would say stay tuned. Uh, I think we are again working with you in terms of uh, bringing out that manuscript, but I think uh, we can address that question then. Then I appreciate that. Okay, in the terms of time, we, we need to move on and thank you again so much for joining uh, Sarah and for, for sharing the data. As I was said, uh, saying in, in the introduction, then we've all uh, uh, looked at PubMed, we look at our famous or we look at our favorite friends uh, and there and then sometimes you see a publication where you're thinking oh my god i should have been doing that or i wish i was part of that and uh, that happened to me when i saw Raghu Kalua's uh, type 1 collagen on the on the alpha 1 and alpha 2 chains i mean that was amazing 
we were lucky enough to have uh, Dr. Kalua in uh, Copenhagen for the extracellular matrix pharmacology symposium, and uh, hopefully we'll see him many times in the future. I know we're going to hear something smart, so I will stop talking and then uh, I will I will leave to to my friend uh, Rogu Kalua here telling us what to do with uh, with matrix in in cancers. Thank you so much for joining, Rogu. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for that wonderful. Uh, introduction and I look forward to being back in Copenhagen and continuing our discussions in the next conference. But I think you did a fantastic job of thinking of this webinar and getting some further discussion on ECM going. So thank you. So um, I had my slides here a second ago and I don't see them oh, now. So. Yeah, if, if you press the start presentation on the bottom four, there's four buttons. On the most right side, it says start presentation. If you press that, then they should show, show up again. Okay, yes. That's right. Then you can just use the arrow keys to go back okay. and forth. Okay. So I, I'm sure you can see my slides. So again, thank you. Uh, look forward to uh, the discussion. So what I want to talk to you today, uh, based on the request I received from more than others, is that uh, to tell you a little bit about some of the new um, findings related to type 1 collagen in the pathogenesis of pancreatic cancer. And uh, so uh, pancreatic cancer, as you know, uh, is one of the deadliest uh, uh, you know, car carcinomas uh, with dismal prognosis and not many uh, new therapies have come along to help these patients. So one really needs to understand the biology of this cancer more so that we can think of uh, interventions. And so if you look at pancreatic tumors, it's really obvious that there are cancer cells in there, but the bulk of the material in a tumor is really made up of fibroblasts and type 1 collagen. They are the major constituents of the stroma element of pancreatic cancer. So one of the interests in the laboratory has been is to understand why are these stromal elements there and what is their function with respect to initiation and progression of pancreatic cancer. So asking this question at a very fundamental level in an unbiased manner generating models to see what we can learn about these constituents and their role in pancreatic cancer. So for that, I need to just introduce a structure of type 1 collagen for a second. Most of you have studied this in your biochemistry classes. This is the most abundant protein in the human body, uh, type 1 collagen, and it is present uh, with respect to uh, polypeptides and alpha-1 chain and alpha-2 chain. So this alpha-1 and alpha-2 chains in a ratio of 2 to 1 come together in a triple helical formation, as you know, which then uh, becomes rigid rods and then becomes fibers and gives you these very massive collagen fiber structures that are present in our tissue, especially in bone and other places. So this is a normal sort of aspect of what how collagen is folded and propeptides pro are removed and these fibers form. So if you were to look at the uh, collagen from the respect to um, genetic animals, in 84, Rudy Enish found a mutant mouse, which actually was deleted of alpha-1 chain of type 1 collagen. And when he studied it, he found that they were embryonic lethal. So they died about E12 to E14 embryonically, and they had ruptured blood vessels and other defects. So this then determined that type 1 collagen is very important embryonically. And after that, no other mouse models were made. So when Jiha Kim came to the laboratory, I asked her, is it possible to make a inducible genetic model for studying type 1 collagen by creating a floxed allele of alpha 1 chain? So that depending on a cell type of interest, we can use a Cree mouse to delete collagen from that cell type and look at the impact of the deposition of the collagen and in the context of disease, what could be the role? So Yang Chen in the laboratory studied it. And first he started crossing them to different fibroblast Crees. And as you know, alpha smooth muscle actin is a marker for myofibroblasts to FAP is a positive uh, you know, marker for fibroblasts and so is FSP1 or S100A4. So these fibroblasts uh, were crossed and what he found is that by deleting it in the alpha semi-positive myofibroblasts in the context of a mouse, he, they were normal. But when he deleted in the FAP positive fibroblasts, they were embryonic lethal. In fact, at the same level of the systemic knockout. So it's very important that these fibroblasts you know, secrete collagen when deposited in the embryogenesis, otherwise you lead to embryonic defect. And of course, when he deleted in the fibroblast positive cells of FSP1 flavor, he found in fact that the deletion of this collagen led to a phenotype of osteogenesis imperfecta, suggesting that in the bone, these cells are very important in making type 1 collagen. So this actually inadvertently developed a mouse model for osteogenesis imperfecta, a cell-specific model that many investigators are using right now. 
So then taking this background information, Yang Chen decided to study this in the context of pancreatic cancer using genetically engineered mouse model. For that, he developed a Frit Flipase model uh, in collaboration with Dieter Sauer. And uh, so they then developed a mouse model where the Frit Flipase system drives the KRAS G12D mutation, a known mutation in pancreatic cancer and P53 deletion. So the mice get spontaneous pancreatic cancer. Now you can cross that to a Cree mouse of your interest, here alpha is semi-Cree, and delete type 1 collagen by crossing it to flox deletion. So overall with lineage tracing and mapping of the epithelial compartment, cancer cell compartment, fibroblast compartment, as you can see here, this fibroblast in red, cancer cells in green, this is an eight allelic mouse, but then spontaneously developed pancreatic cancer with the loss of collagen world production alpha by alpha SMA cells. By doing that, he found in fact something interesting. By deleting collagen one from myofibroblast alpha SMA positive cells, he found that the tumors were softer, which it should because they have less collagen. Overall, the tumor had 50% less collagen in matrix, but then the mice actually died sooner. So collagen production, when it is interrupted from myofibroblasts, the mice died sooner, suggesting that collagen made by these cells to give rigid tumors and more collagen in the stroma is actually protective. So this was surprising to us. So then he studied this further in the context of T cell correlation and levels of collagen in human. And in fact, found that when there's more collagen in the stroma of these tumors, there's more T cells. So that's good. You need more immune surveillance. And in fact, when patients have very low collagen in them, in their tumors, their survival is dismal. So having more collagen in tumors is better. And in fact, five to seven year survival, collagen high tumors in the context of pancreatic cancer, the patients live longer by 25%, whereas at seven years, 0% are alive. So this shows that in fact, collagen is good for us in the context of myofibroblast making it, and in fact, deletion of it, and a lot of the biology is published, led to decrease overall survival. So this was published and we show in fact that deletion of collagen leads to gene expression pattern of cancer cell that leads to uh, SOX regulated CXCL5. CXCL5 production then regulates the um, you know, MDSCs and then those then can inhibit T cells and B cells. So there's a lot of communication that goes on with collagen providing this outside and signaling benefit. And so this again shows that collagen rich versus collagen poor tumors have this differential in the way that uh, they regulate tumor progression. So collagen one made by stromal cells, especially myofibroblasts is protective. It restrains can pancreatic cancer, not promote it. So then this led us to asking the question, well, let's look at other cell types that make collagen one. So then we looked at in cancer cells that make collagen also. It has been reported that cancer cells also can make collagen. So we wondered what happens if we delete collagen from these cancer cells using a CRE that is uh, part of our genetic model and deleting collagen one. Now the fibroblasts, everybody else is making the collagen as they should, except cancer cells, whatever small amounts they make are now deleted of collagen one ab production ability. So when we did that, we found interestingly that in fact, the mice live longer. So collagen made by cancer cells had this opposite phenotype versus collagen made by stromal cells. And in fact, even early lesions were inhibited when collagen was deleted. So then we asked the question, what is the difference between a collagen that is made by cancer cells versus collagen made by myofibroblasts? Collagen is collagen. So we looked at the structure again and said, let's do some Western blots and see if collagen is made properly. When we did that experiment, we found in fact that collagen made by cancer cells only had alpha one chain, whereas collagen made by fibroblasts had alpha one, alpha two chain. The normal way of collagen production should be with the, both the chains. In pancreatic cancer cells, again, collagen one uh, has only alpha one chain of cancer cells, whereas fibroblasts make alpha one, alpha two. So in fact, all cancer cells we found, in fact, only had alpha one chain versus fibroblasts make alpha two chain. So this was interesting. So cancer cells are only making alpha one chain of type one collagen, but never, you know, both the chains as fibroblasts do. So we looked at it more carefully and looked at the mRNA expression, which validated that the mRNA for alpha-2 is not present in cancer cells, whereas it's present for the alpha-1 chain. Whereas even cancer cells from mouse models all had no alpha-2 chain, whereas alpha-1 chain was present. So this is very interesting. So fibroblasts make alpha-1, alpha-2, whereas cancer cells transcripts are not present. So we looked at the broad database and found the same thing. So you can look at any database of your interest. You'll find that the cancer cells hardly make alpha-2 chain, whereas fibroblasts 
in the databases make alpha one, alpha two. So with this consistent information, we'll look at more of the biochemistry of it. So I'm just summarizing this in the slide that what we found is that the fibroblasts made by fibroblasts actually have production of alpha one, alpha two chain. They form these heterotrimers as shown here, which is 97% of the stromal collagen, whereas a small amount of collagen, 3% of the entire collagen is made by cancer cells, which is only alpha one chain forming these homotrimers. So this homotrimer is possible only because alpha two chain is not there. And what is important to state here is that the mice and humans do not have alpha one homotrimers in any of their tissue. So this is an abnormal collagen made by collagen one, made by cancer cells. There's the entire body is heterotrimeric. So think about it for a second. The cancer cells are making their own matrix, collagen one, but a unique form that is not present in any other body for their own benefit. Because if you delete it, tumors get slower, survival increases. So with that information, we went to look at more biochemistry. We did circular diachroism and other things that one can do for studying folding. We found, in fact, that they're not the simple rigid structure. They're very sort of consorted, uh, contorted in their structure. And in fact, they denature much more slowly. So they're very tightly bound uh, than heterotrimers. And when you look at MMP cleavage, the collagen made by fibroblasts get cleaved very nicely by uh, MMP1 or MMP2, whereas the cancer cell collagen is not degraded as easily. So this is a very tightly wound collagen that hangs around longer, not degradable by MMPs, and has this unique melting point also. So with this, then we look to see if now we culture cancer cells, okay, in the context of, um, you know, delete, uh, taken from mice that do not have collagen one production ability in the cancer cells versus the ones that do, which means that these cells can make, cancer cells can make collagen homotrimer, these cells cannot because we deleted them. And just look at proliferation. What we found is that the ability of not making collagen one by cancer cells makes it proliferation slower. So again, you can pause and think that the genetic mutations are same in these cancer cells, but the inability to make type one collagen homotrimer makes them proliferate slower. So it's like a tonic. It's like a mitogen almost, this homotrimer. And in fact, tumors grow slower also when you implant them when they do not have the capacity to make collagen homotrimer. So then we looked at organoid formation and found that organoids form very well when they can make homotrimer, these cancer cells, but one not when they cannot. So homotrimer production by cancer cell is important for organoid formation. So it's like a nice tonic for organoid formation. So then we looked at to see if there are any mutations in the alpha-2 chain. So now your question will be, Raghu, why are these cancer cells not making alpha-2 transcript? Could there be a mutation? So we looked at all of the genome of all of these cancer cells that do not make alpha-2, no mutation at all. So it's not the mutation that is having an impact in loss of alpha-2 chain, but in fact, it turns out that the loss of alpha-2 chain is because of hypermethylation of the promoter region of the alpha-2 chain in the cancer cells, but not normal epithelial cells. So cancer cells very early on, because of mutagenesis in the KRAS locus, especially the data I'm not gonna show you, lead to DNMT production, all of these epigenetic regulators that actually will methylate the promoter of alpha-2 chain, along with probably other promoters methylating, which would then lead to suppression of the expression of the alpha-2 chain transcript. That is the reason why these cancer cells do not make alpha-2 chain. So then after Jenna did that, she then treated these cells with 5-azacytidine, which is a demethylating agent, as you know. If you take cancer cells now, treat them with 5-azacytidine, you can recover alpha-2 chain expression. So these cancer cells will now start making alpha-2 chain again. So that shows that this is epigenetic regulation. What we go on to show, in fact, is that this collagen homotrimer binds to alpha-3 beta-1 integrin and induces a pro-survival signal for cancer cells through DDR1, FAC, AKT, and ARC. So this is a very nice pro-survival signal that enables them to survive more, proliferate more, as I've shown you earlier in the culture system through this mechanism uh, intracellularity. We looked at the tissue to ask the question, the receptor that we have just identified as alpha-3 integrin, what would be its expression pattern in pancreatic tumors? We found very interestingly that this alpha-3 integrin is present on epithelial cells, that is cancer cells in the tumors. And you can see in different levels. And if you take that uh, you know, assessment, and show it, it shows in fact that the alpha-3 integrin expression on epithelial cells, carcinoma cells of a pancreatic tumor, if it's high, then the survival is less. That means that the homotrimer will be signaling to induce survival in these cells. So less alpha-3 integrin is better because homotrimer cannot signal through them and provide survival signals. So this then led to ask the question, 
Well, if this is the case, then let us now provide alpha-3 integrins suppressing siRNA through exosomes that we use for delivering drugs. And then when we did that, we found the same phenotype. So suppressing the homotrimer by deletion increases overall survival, but if you take its receptor away, it increases overall survival. So all of this suggests that this alpha-3 um, integrin, beta-1 integrin binding to homotrimer gives the survival signal to cancer cells. But what we also found very interestingly is that along with that cell autonomous effect that the homotrimer has, it also has effect on the microenvironment. That means some of the things that upon binding to alpha-3 integrin as a secretome being released by cancer cells or whatever other cells manipulations going on through intercellular communication, that the CD3 positive cells, CD3, uh, CD8 and CD4 positive cells all are going up, which is good. That means homotrimer is restraining immune cells from coming in. So it's like coating cancer cells from immune cells coming in. And when you take the homotrimer away, you have this uh, T cells and B cells coming in. And in fact, we show that the recruitment is because after taking homotrimer away, CXCL16 is reinitiated in expression, which recruits CD8 positive, PD1 positive, grandine B positive cells. So you can see the tremendous role of collagen in regulating through signaling recruitment of the immune system. So having done this, we wondered what else is going on in the microenvironment of these tumors because immune system regulation in tumors is directly connected to microbiome. So we wondered if these immune cells are coming in, not only because of the secretome, but because the microbiome of these tumors is changing. So we looked at the microbiome and found in fact that the microbiome of the pancreatic tumors is much different when collagen alpha-1 is deleted. You can see that the when alpha-1 homotrimer is deleted, these pancreatic tumors have a different bi microbiome with Campylobacter alis increasing in number and bacterial dialysis is going down. So bacterial dialysis is going down, which is a hypoxia-associated uh, microbiome, which is actually inhibits angiogenesis, inhibit, and causes much more of tumor progression. So when you remove alpha-1 oh, homotrimer, you lose this bacterial dialysis and Campylobacter alis, which is beneficial bacteria, goes up. So then we said, we looked at gut microbiome. We didn't see much difference in tumor microbiome. We saw this difference. Then we said, let's just delete the microbiome by giving antibiotic and see if that has an impact on the mediation of alpha-1 homotrimer, collagen homotrimer on T-cell recruitment and overall survival. So we successfully deleted it. You can see all the microbiome is gone. And then we did the experiment again. So now you take the pancreatic tumor mice with homotrimer, but with antibiotic, no difference. That means without the homotrimer manipulation, there's no difference. The microbiome remains the same. But now you take away the microbiome by giving antibiotics in the context of the collagen 1 homotrimer deletion. This is the overall survival when collagen 1 homotrimer is deleted, as I mentioned. But when the microbiome, the beneficial microbiome is deleted, you can see the survival is moving towards the control. That means survival has decreased. So this suggests that the homotrimer presence through its metabolites that the cancer cell is releasing through outside and signaling to integrin, these metabolites are somehow having impact on generating difference in microbiome, which then is having an impact on the immune cells. It's a very nice way of showing how collagen has tremendous impact on the microenvironment. Uh, through this process. So this paper was published a few months ago. You can look at it and, uh, and see more of the data there, but it's very exciting to show that homotrimers are this unique collagen made by pancreatic cancer cells and in fact have an impact on the tumor microbiome and immunity, suggesting that we should not think of collagen as just a structural component, but also as an important signaling component that cancer cells have hijacked and created their own variety of it with that normal cells don't making them pro-oncogenic. So with that, I want to thank the people who did the work, Kate and Krishnan and other people are the who really did the work that I showed you. I've shown you pictures of them and my collaborators who made this work possible. And with that, I'll show the picture of the laboratory and thank you very much and happy to answer one or two quick questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Raghu. That, uh, that was a fantastic talk. Really, really appreciate that. I am... Um, I'd love to see this story involve. Um, so if if um, if we just have a few minutes for for questioning, I can I would love to start with the first one. I mean, you know there are twenty eight collagens and forty six different side chains uh, or, or alpha chains to to be put together. Is this homo hetero story? Is that collagen type one specific, or, or or can that be extended to other fibrillar collagens? 
Uh, it potentially could be, but I think that thermodynamically, the alpha one chain of type one collagen seems to be able to fold with other alpha chains to give homo trimer. Whereas, for example, in type four collagen, for example, if you delete the alpha two chain, it does not form alpha one homo trimer. So there are certain uh, thermodynamic requirements that are uh, necessary for certain collagens to form homo trimer, whereas other collagens, as you know, exist as homo trimers. Uh, you know, type, uh, you know, other type collagens. So I think that one has to sort of go through this very carefully. You and I discussed this also when we last met, is that we have to do some uh, screening for epigenetics to see whether other collagen promoters are getting methylated and what would be their consequence. I think it would be a good screening method, even at a commercial level for companies to see what that impact could be. But uh, type 4 collagen is a great example. You remove it, you don't find homo trimers. So it's a very unique thing for type 1 collagen at the moment, but that could be for other collagens also, but it needs to be looked at. Thank you. I'm going to take a few uh, questions from the chat because that's exploding. Um, one of those questions is, uh, how could we pharmacologically target uh, tumor homotrimer formation? Well, I mean, one way to look at it is to target hum uh, homotrimer formation, of course. Maybe there's a certain chaperone that is existing that only is a enables binding of the homotrimer, but not the heterotrimer. And that could be targeted. That screening uh, is ongoing. And, uh, you know, again, Morton and I talked about collaborating in those areas and seeing what we can do together uh, as a collaboration. But also one of the ways to look at it is that try to interfere with the impact of the homo trimer on the cell, which is binding to alpha-3 beta-1 integrin. So alpha-3 beta-1 integrin antibody could be a great way to neutralize that binding, as I showed you with the experiment. Then you get you neutralize a consequence of the binding of the homo trimer to the alpha-3 beta-1 integrin, which only expresses on pancreatic cancer cells. It's not present in normal epithelial cells of pancreas. So it shows that it's an integrin that's coming up only in, on cancer cells. So that one way to interfere would be that. That's a, that's a good answer. I'm going to allow myself one before I, I go to the chat again. So, so thinking of integrin biology, I mean, sometimes when I've been reading papers on different... Uh, different groups doing integrin biology and they're not they're using small linear peptides to look at interactions not even hetero trimers or homo trimers but but in reality are your data not suggesting that we should revisit many of the compounds being developed in the integrin biology because we need to be much more specific with those interactions it's not just integrin collagen interaction but those experiments need to be redone possibly I completely agree with you. I'm a true believer in the comment you made. I think sometimes in a scientific journey and in the time frame of when sci how science evolves, we tend to do experiments a decade sooner than they should be because we don't know much about the biology yet. So many of the integrin interactions and what that could mean for cancer need is being unraveled more and more now. So I think that maybe certain experiments that were done and maybe didn't give the right results because the readouts were not good maybe at that time. But now the readouts are much better and we can do many other analyses now. So I completely agree with you, Morton, that we need to really revisit uh, integrin targeting and specific integrin targeting to the ligand and really to do this as a screen again, as an endeavor. And I bet we will find some very interesting targets now especially alpha-3 beta-1 integrin hardly expresses in many tissues, expresses in the kidney and the protocytes a bit, but not anywhere else. So if you make an antibody to it and it opportunistically, uh, mm -hmm. we could have a great target to inhibit homo trimer formation only at the cancer cells, right? There's no other interaction happening anywhere else because there's no yeah. homo trimer anywhere else. Oh, that's a good discussion. We're going to take a few more questions from the chat here. So, so just, uh, Morton, in the meanwhile, I would like to invite uh, Saurabh and uh, yeah, Nicholas yeah, yeah. to the stage as well, so they can. Uh, I'm getting all excited. I'm Sorry. happy to. I'm happy to answer. I'm happy to answer another question because I have to move on to something else yeah. I need to do. So I'll answer another question and pass it on to my colleagues to answer other questions. I'm Thank going you. to take the last question from the chat. Have you started this in old versus young mice and humans? Are there more? Does uh, monotrimers appear uh, when subject H? It's a fantastic question. Um, we're doing those experiments and we will hold off on telling you the results until we validate it. But there's something fascinating about aging and homotrimer. I can just leave you with that hook. But more than next time when I see you, I'll, I'll give you much more information there. I can't wait to, to see that. Thank you so much for joining.
Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Appreciate it. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have. Yeah, go ahead, Morten. No, please go ahead, Mayo. If if you select questions from because yeah. I may be slightly biased when I select <laughs> questions from the. <laughs> you go. Uh, ahead. Just a reminder for the for the folks that are attending. Please write your uh, questions in the private chat, and we will still be able to answer them. All right. So uh, one question for uh, Nicholas. So if we give a patient drugs to induce uh, stromalysis, would you expect that proceed three decreases during treatment uh, if stromalysis is successful? That's a fairly tricky question, but uh, fair enough. Uh, I would expect uh, stromalysis to be reflected by more degradation biomarkers than actually the propeptide, because propeptide Propeptides are released as part of the buildup of fibers, where other biomarkers are released as far, part of the uh, other fragments from type 3 collagen are released as part of the degradation process. So it's really the two sides of the of the coins that we need to look at. So yeah. can I take one? Uh, and I think because this question will go to both. Um, the question is, the, is there a feedback loop or feedforward loop of ProC3? Does that mean, is there a biological activity associated with ProC3? Um, and then I'm going to add, add a, a addition to that. So from these collagens we look at, uh, can you talk a little bit about the collagen signaling versus the collagen biomarker part? If we're going to start with uh, with the you, uh, and then we will go to... Uh, uh, Sarah afterwards. So, yeah, so ProC3, I mean, um, so when we look in vitro and we uh, can correlate ProC3 to a more dense and um, linearized matrix, and then when we re-seize fibroblast and other cells onto such a matrix, that's definitely a feedback mechanism. So, fibroblast, uh, ProC3 is High matrices have more fibrotic activity built into them than a normal fibroblast matrices. Um, there are also, to the cryptic side, questions of signaling capacity. Um, of course, the possibility that a more denatured, a more altered, a more degraded uh, matrix can expose these cryptic sites that we are not signaling two interferons or two other receptors and nearby driver, a feedback mechanism. For instance, uh, endotrophin, which can also be measured with pro C6, is, is one of these, these fragments that is in the public domain. Sarah, can, can you extend a little bit on the, on the, the capacity of some of these collagens, the difference of being signaling or biomarkers? I think, uh, I think that, that, yeah. I think in a way, maybe it would be provocative. Maybe it's we are understanding them layer by layer. So maybe we know, for example, signaling capacity of tumstatin 2 C6 now. But maybe I think this signaling uh, angle need to be probed across these tumor, uh, across these different ECM markers. Maybe and uh, that what if we do in a very methodical approach, maybe we get surprised. But I think those methodical studies where you take the cell lines, you try to understand from clinical trial samples, you try to understand for both from the circulating component and within the tumor micro environment. I think that need to be more kind of, these have been anecdotal in certain aspects, but you know, as uh, Dr. Kaluri presented, there are kind of people who are looking into this matrix, uh, immunology matrix biology together. So I think those approaches have collated all the data collated together. And if we take those approaches, maybe I think that should reveal the answer. But in way of the clinical studies, clinical trial, I think uh, we do see impact of both, you know, uh, the IO therapy and the baseline markers impacting the outcomes. But is there a feed forward or feed, uh, you know, feedback loop? Uh, for that, I think we have to resort to uh, go back to the bench side uh, uh, before we uh, explore that at the bedside. But I think at the bedside, the signatures or the signaling is 
uh, good that first of all you guys have already laid out the path in terms of the clinical utility across other therapeutic indications so those can be learned pretty fast but again we have to build up our momentum at the bench, uh, bedside also thank you so much Aaron. um i think we are being conscious of time we need to uh, we need to finalize the uh, this session i want to to thank uh, Nicholas and Tarp for giving wonderful talks, uh, showing us how this can be implemented to, to change the life of patients. I think we we uh, you will have a survey coming out and please suggest uh, new uh, topics for us to have uh, uh, future extracellular matrix pharmacology meetings on. I think we need to be more attentive to the tissue destruction part. Uh, I worry that I thought I was becoming reasonably smart at collagen biology, and then I meet uh, Raku Kalue and telling me that I need to revisit my collagen book and my my beliefs. And I think uh, the journey is just starting. So thank you to everybody that are interested in collagen research. I can uh, thank and thank you again to the speakers. Do you have any final comments, Mayu? I'm sure I've forgotten something. No, no, that's all right. We have uh, we've have a lot of questions, and we will make sure to follow up with you by email. So uh, don't worry about the questions. We'll make sure to answer them uh, afterwards. Thank you so much. And thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.